So you know, our community generates a large body of work every year, all of which are interesting in their own right. Each published paper and sometimes many of the rejected papers capture significant thought, creativity, and ideas that come from the authors. Each year, we also recognize a number of papers as best papers in our conference that stand out more prominently than the rest. However, when the technical program committee selects some of these papers, they are done based on future promise. The real impact of any such work can sometimes be truly appreciated with the benefit of time, since truly pioneering and significant contributions reveal themselves as others read them, use them, and apply them into future activities. This sustained relevance of the papers proved to us that they have actually stood the test of time. <coughs> With this in mind, ACM SIGMOBILE has recently constituted the new ACM SIGMOBILE Test of Time Award. The SIGMOBILE Test of Time Award recognizes papers that have sustained and significant impact on our community over at least a decade. And the award recognizes the paper's influences often not fully apparent at the time of publication, but can be best judged with the perspective of time. I'm Shuman Banerjee from University of Wisconsin, and it's a pleasure, honor, and privilege to be chairing this session that recognizes few of our inaugural Test of Time awardees. Before we go on to uh, specifics about the award winners, I wanted to give you a little bit of background of how some of these papers got picked. Uh, this being the inaugural year uh, was a particularly challenging process. Uh, our criteria for picking test of time award winners is that they should be published at least 10 years or earlier. And they can be published in any venue, not just a SIGMOBILE venue, which essentially opens it up to the whole world uh, to have contributions to the broad SIGMOBILE community. To do this, we constituted a very uh, significant community uh, from leaders in our field, chaired by Andrew Campbell at Dartmouth University, and a number of other people across industry, academia, across different continents, including Ramon Caceres, Anin De, Cecilia Mascolo, <coughs> Dina Papajinaki, Ashu Sabarwal, and Lin Zong. Uh, some of them are in this audience today. They put in a significant amount of effort because this was the first year of this award, and uh, through their process, they actually considered 54 different papers for consideration for this award. They had multiple, multiple online meetings. I think they met online three times and a face-to-face -face meeting. And at the end of it, they picked 11 papers to win the first Test of Time Award. Of course, we have a significant celebration of the Test of Time Award winners in New York City in early October at ACM Mobicom, where I'm told eight out of 11 of these winners are going to be represented. But we wanted to take this opportunity of being all together here at Mobisys and introduce to you some of the winners who actually are with us here and hear from them a bit of perspective on their work and the broad context on which they did some of these things. So with that, I wanted to first um, introduce to you the Test of Time Award winners. And here they are. <coughs> So let's give a huge round of applause to our inaugural class of Test of Time Award winners. 
So with that, what we wanted to do today is to introduce two of these award winners here on stage and have them talk a little bit about their, about their work. But to do that, uh, we also are lucky to have uh, two of the papers have the nominators who nominated these papers for awards also here. So first, I would like to invite Landon Cox to talk about the paper CODA. Um, thank you, Suman. Um, so I'm going to keep my comments very brief because we'd much rather hear uh, from Satya. Um, so when thinking about uh, disconnected operation in the code of file system by Jay Kistler and Satya, I had uh, two things come to mind. The first is it brought me back to when I was an undergrad um, in the late 90s, taking a class from Carla Ellis, who used to be a very, uh, regular member of our community, and reading the code of paper and just being blown away at how cool it was. Just thinking, oh my goodness, I want this uh, for my laptop. Um, and that was obviously not the only person to react to this paper um, in this way because it inspired so much other work among uh, researchers at, at that time. And then I started thinking, well, you know, there are probably people here um, who are younger than a certain age. And when they read the code of paper, they might think, uh, well, you know, what's the big deal? Everybody does this already, right? And I, that turns out to be true as well. Almost any client software that you look at that has to interact with a remote service provides some kind of disconnected operation, okay? The idea that we can use caching for availability is pervasive in almost all the software systems that we use, and we owe it to this paper. So um, I hope uh, it's an honor to present this uh, paper to Satya to give up the stage to him. Good, you can see that? Is this loud enough? Can you raise your hand at the back if you can hear me clearly? Okay, great. So thank you very much, Suman and Landon, and for all those very nice words. Um, the person who did all the work that deserves this award is really not here. He was my first PhD student, Jay Kistler, but he will be in New York when the award is officially given. What I wanted to do is, I have about 10 slides here, and I'm not going to go into any technical detail, but to just give you a little bit of the background in which this work arose and a few fun things and a few retrospective thoughts, okay? So when you think of cloud computing, we think of it as something that arose in the past decade. But here's a picture, cut and paste, from a 1986 paper showing a cloud. We didn't come up with a clever name cloud at that time, uh, but this is an example of the vision of the Andrews system and Andrew file system, AFS, is a system that unites an enterprise, in this particular case, originally Carnegie Mellon, um, and allows people to sit down anywhere and the files appear at that machine as if it had been installed there. So this whole notion of caching from the cloud really arose in the context of this work. And a few years later, there was a paper that I wrote which made two points, which it's a 1990 paper, but it's re very relevant today, that the thing that caching gives you is something, are two precious things. One, it gives you user mobility, which of course is the topic of this conference. You can go anywhere and your world is delivered to you on demand. The second thing that it does for you is it simplifies system administration. You can destroy a piece of hardware, put a fresh one, and the world appears. So this is the world that we created from about 1981 to, sorry, 83 to 86 at CMU. And it was deployed, life was wonderful. This is the first line, AFS. However, there was one problem. Uh, the networking hardware, even Ethernet in that day was a little flaky. There was a fair amount of manual configuration that people got wrong. Servers died, and one of the critical lessons that I personally learned in using AFS was that the more dependent you become on the cloud, 
the more painful it is when the cloud is inaccessible. And so CODA began as a project to say, how can we preserve this wonderful world where the world is brought to you on demand wherever you are, but without this one critical shortcoming? So I called it CODA for a very simple reason. I thought that you know, AFS was the big piece of work, and CODA would be a brace, graceful bringing to an end. You know, it's a small piece of work. Well, the tail wagged the dog. It turns out that the total number of papers published on CODA, the ideas from CODA, have turned out to be, in hindsight, much bigger than AFS. Um, and interestingly, it has led to a lot of side effects which we could have never anticipated. So Dropbox, that I think everyone in this room probably uses, was directly inspired by AFS and CODA. So that picture down there are the founders of, of Dropbox. And they were undergraduates at MIT, where AFS was deployed as part of Project Athena. And when they graduated, they realized that the convenient world that they had enjoyed inside MIT was not available. And they asked themselves, well, why is this? And the answer was, well, it's a little harder than you think to actually deploy something that includes operating system modifications, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that led them to create Dropbox, which, as you know, tries to provide a similar illusion without actually using caching. But what is also interesting is disconnected operation is part of the design of Dropbox. You're able to use the system without, without uh, actual network connectivity. There's not been the only impact. Uh, Luster, which you see up there, which is the most widely used distributed file system for high performance computing, was built by Peter Brom, who was a key researcher who worked on CODA in the 1990s, and Jay Kistler, who is the first author on the paper that is being honored here today, was my first PhD student. He did a startup um, called Maginatics in 2010, and it was bought out by EMC in 2014 combining all the ideas of CODA and AFS in a modern cloud computing context. So it's been a fun ride. So I, I told you I tried to share some, some fun things that came along. And one of the things I've always loved about this line of work were the cartoons that it inspired. Many years ago, in fact 1990, I published a paper with this title. It's closely related to the paper in, in question here. It tried to summarize many aspects, and this was published in IEEE Computer. A few months later, I received a letter, the old-fashioned postal letter, uh, from a Japanese publication saying we would love to translate it and, uh, and publish your article. And I said, I'm fine with it. If IEEE gives you the, the permission, I'm fine. But I would appreciate one copy of your publication as a souvenir. Many months later, it did arrive in the mail, and I paged through it. It was funny to see my name you know, in a Japanese article. But what was really funny was that it had cartoons like this one. So you see this big boulder, and, and I figured out that what it was representing was obstacles to data access. You notice the floppies being delivered by, by fork truck. Um, this, in one cartoon, embodies the concept of disconnected operation. On the left side is AFS. The network is broken, and all the people look unhappy. The people on the right are running CODA. The network is broken, and they're happy. Uh, this is about wireless connectivity, the fact that the connectivity may not be symmetric. It may not be transitive. You may have weird connectivity patterns. Uh, and this essentially summarizes the fact that a cache is a finite resource. So if you pin too many files in the cache, and those guys with blue suits, if you notice carefully on their legs, it says sticky, which is pinning the object in the cache. If you do that, there's not enough cache space left for other objects to be brought in, which is signified by the people who are trying to get in, but can't seem to do so. And then this is about security, the security model of CODA, which involves trust in the server, but not at the edges of the network. So um, to me, I don't understand a word of Japanese, but the fact that I could interpret these cartoons 
and know that whoever drew them had been correctly instructed in the working of Kara was a perfect example of the end-to-end -end argument. Okay. So fast forwarding to today, you know, this paper is it was actually originally published in SOSB 1991 October, so that makes it 25 years, right? How can anything possibly still be relevant that we wrote 25 years ago? So these are the opening sentences of this paper, right, which I wrote 25 years ago. The, this is the critical point, that as you become more dependent on the cloud in modern terminology, your pain, your suffering, is all the more greater when it is missing. Now, there have already been instances of cloud outages for important services. So Siri has been missing in action a couple of times. Uh, Netflix, which uses the cloud for video streaming, has had uh, uh, glitches of its own. <coughs> Our assumption as we buy into cloud computing is that the cloud is always reachable. And it's important to appreciate that there are environments in which this assumption is not true. So, for example, in a military scenario, the network is always under attack by the enemy. In a disaster recovery after Hurricane Sandy, I know that Ramon, when he was at AT&T, uh, had to deal with this. Um, and, and any hurricane, earthquake, uh, uh, floods, in general, when you have destroyed network infrastructure, uh, you have the potential for limited capacity networking, which means that you're effectively disconnected or weakly connected. A developing country, that picture shows the physical infrastructure, but the networking infrastructure is not much better. You may have theoretical connectivity to the cloud, but in practice, the connectivity is so poor that you might as well be disconnected. And the last point is that as the frequency of cyber attacks increases, in effect, it's as if you're disconnected. So while the exact implementations are going to have to obviously be different for different cloud services, the notion that you want to be able to depend on the cloud service when available, but have graceful fallback that allows you to continue operation when it is temporarily unavailable, that is a powerful idea which I'm very happy to have had a part uh, in, in helping to demonstrate how to make that possible in at least one, one arena. So here are four thoughts about this work, and this is my last slide. If I had not personally depended seriously on AFS, I would have never felt the pain. And if I hadn't felt the pain, there's no way we would have built Coda. So, in a very real sense, the old adage about eating your own dog food, depending on what you build seriously enough that it makes a difference, in this case certainly proved extraordinarily valuable. The second point may be a bit mysterious, two firsts are precious. In computer science, we are very used to trade-offs. We have CPU and memory trade-off. You can use more memory and less CPU or vice versa bandwidth and energy, and so on. So there, there are many trade-offs. You can give one up, but gain somewhere else. It's extraordinarily rare that you win without giving up something. And the notion of using caching, which you were going to do anyway for performance, also has a payoff for availability. That's quite rare. So uh, when you see any opportunity to get a twofer, almost certainly there's something precious there that's worth exploring. Reach for the sky may also be a bit cryptic, but it refers to the fact that early in the days of formulating what it is we are trying to solve, we had a lot of internal debates in my group about, is it really the case we should focus on zero bandwidth? I mean, you're likely to be able to get at least a few kilobits per second, maybe a few megabits per second. This is 1990, so megabits was unrealistic, but tens of kilobits was quite realistic. We chose to go ahead and consider the extreme case of zero bits per second. And from a research strategy point of view, it was a perfect choice that pushing ourselves to the extreme made all the difference because we could no longer get away 
with many solutions that would have been okay, but would have not worked when completely um, disconnected. So the last point, working code trumps all hype, refers to the fact that, you know, we actually built the system, we actually deployed it, we used it ourselves, and while the code is old and, you know, none of us have had the time to put the energy in to make it much better, it still works amazingly. So the slides that I'm showing you right now are being shown from Coda, disconnected on this Linux laptop. Thank you. Thank you, Satya, and that was uh, great to see. Uh, you know, a few images are worth of thousands of words, I guess. <laughs> so uh, we'll have time for questions after, but I wanted to uh, now invite uh, Romit Roy Choudhury to introduce the radar paper. Um, you know, I typically don't like to carry pieces of paper when I come onto the stage to give a talk, but today I had to because there's so many numbers that I had to copy from Wikipedia that I could not memorize them. So, uh, pardon this paper that I have with me. Uh, it's a pleasure to actually, it was a pleasure for me to nominate uh, Radar, an in-building location tracking, an in-building RF-based user location and tracking system, which was accepted in Infocom 2000. Um, Radar is a paper that I read first uh, when I was an undergrad, I, and as Landon mentioned with other papers, many of these papers have this feeling, okay, what's the big deal? And these are, this is one of those papers that as I read multiple times through age, I feel, whoa, this is so much, so beautiful, so elegant. And the realization has really been recently is that it's not about the idea about that wireless multipath and wireless signals are unique at different locations. That's really very cool. But what was really the best part to me was that at a time, 1999, when people are still thinking about Wi-Fi as a new modality of connectivity, right? 802.11b was not ratified yet. People are thinking of how to design the protocol, RTS, CTS, blah, blah, blah. Here is a set of people who come and think or come and bet that, you know, wireless connectivity is going to be there. Wi-Fi is going to win this competition about wireless, about connectivity, and then started thinking, you know what, you can piggyback applications on top of that connectivity platform, and localization would be one of those uh, applications. And that, I think, is a piece of insight that, that, that's rare, and I think that is what has come to make Radar a very powerful and impactful paper uh, over the long run. Uh, some of the, some of the uh, stats that, that run with the paper, um, let me start with citations. The total number of citations uh, for radar till today is 7,715, okay? And more importantly, in 2015, there were 595 citations, 713 in 2014, and 691 in 2013. Uh, even my best, my, my highest cited paper is less than many of these papers. Uh, and, and also, it's important to note that 15 years later after this paper is published, it's so widely cited in the research community today. Uh, Radar has around 12 patents around it. There are many companies, many startups that have violated these patents, and I think Microsoft is just waiting, right, to kind of sue many of these, many of these companies who are actually using these patents. Um, many CSEC departments use these in their courses when, when they teach. Many PhD theses have been written on this paper. Jeffrey Hightower, Mustafa, my student Shovik, many of them have done this. And last but not the least, I would say, if you haven't read the paper, Radar, go and read it. It's an example where the paper, the problem is formulated precisely, the presentation is fantastic, the evaluation is thorough, and the claims humble and beautifully made. It's an example of a really well-written paper that grad students should be given up front during their PhD careers. Uh, without further ado, I would invite Victor and uh, Venkat to actually come and tell us more about the stories and things behind Radar. It's an honor. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, Wenkert is here too, and uh, he's going to come right after me. I won't take too much time. I didn't prepare any slides per se, 
but I want to share a little bit of story uh, about radar and how it came about. I actually shared, for those of you who were in Mobicom in 2013, you probably uh, heard a talk from me. I had won the OCA, the Outstanding Contribution Award, and I uh, relayed this story as part of it. But then I was told recently that many of you uh, may not have been there, or many of that community is a little different. So let me, um, let me uh, tell you the story a little bit. So I joined Microsoft in about 1997, and uh, when I joined, I was, uh, uh, my career was a little different than in the sense that I had uh, done my master's, and then I had worked for this company, Digital Equipment Corporation, which was you know, a very large and very prosperous company. Uh, and then I got my PhD. From my, after getting my PhD, I decided that I wanted to go uh, do something different, and so I came to Microsoft Research. And I had studied wireless computing, wireless networking. And it wasn't as big as Romit pointed out. There wasn't that much going on in the industry or anywhere else for that matter. So when I came, I was sort of very excited about it. And I thought, hey, I was the first guy in Microsoft to think about this. And I thought, think bold, do something big. And so I tried to convince my management, who was Dan Ling at the time, to let me go and make uh, Building 31 or wireless. So that was sort of the first step to do it. And uh, you know, he, he said, great, because I wanted to do research at scale, and the only way to do scale was to actually build out a network that was big enough. So I worked with a little company called Aeronet, uh, got them to install uh, a wireless network all over the place. I'm giving you the short version here, by the way. <laughs> so anyway, so then once that happened, then, um, <clears throat> then the question was that I wanted to do something fun with it, right? I wanted to sort of do some interesting things, but Windows treated wireless as Ethernet. It was just a pipe. You just send packets, and the packets go on the other one side, go on the other side. Well, that wasn't good enough, so I went to the product groups and said, hey, we need to change the programming interface here. I need to be able to get to, to, the, to the level where I can look at signal strands, or I can do some error correction, or I can do, you know, what have you, all the different things. And I wrote, so I, I knew I had to speak their language, so really I, I spent a lot of time writing a spec which, was, which precisely told the product groups what they needed to implement. And so they looked at it, they were you know, uh, encouraging, but they had other things in mind, they didn't want to do anything about it. The thing was, so I came back from that and I thought, what I failed to tell them was that I didn't, couldn't tell them what the value of doing this extra work was, right? So I, I told them that you could do all these fun things, but product groups are very, very focused on the customer needs, they're focused on what they can do that somebody will actually buy and they can make money. They're not going to spend any other money on any other thing that is good for the soul. Anyway, so I came back and I thought, what could I do? Now, before I came to Microsoft, uh, I was, um, you know, I got my PhD from UMass Amherst, and there I had written a paper called Mobility Modeling and Trajectory Tracking, uh, which was published in 1998 in IEEE JSAC. And it was a beautiful piece of work. I still think to this day it had Kalman filtering in it, it had pattern recognition, and all the good stuff from control theory, signal processing that I had known. But it was a disaster because it was too complicated. It was the paper that even I, after reading it again, couldn't really do much with it. But that paper had left this germ in my head that we could potentially do location, right? So then as I was thinking about what is it that I could prove that you could do something special for the, if, uh, if you had this programmability inside the wire, in, in wireless NICs, then you know, thought was, hey, maybe we can do a localization. And so from that emerged uh, what is radar. Now I won't go into more details other than that, because I know Venkut has more to say on it. And we actually, by the way, Venkut, uh, um, I actually had Venkut in 1998, I think, from UC Berkeley at the time, and he was the perfect guy to collaborate with on this particular uh, project, and we did, and uh, something good happens. Now I'm going to just shift gear to 2016 and 2015. So as I look back and I look at so many citations, there's no question I'm flattered, and we are all, all flattered. It's a good thing to have, but it sort of saddens me too a little bit, and it sort of saddens me that I see people not learning from what we learned. Okay, so what did we learn? So once we did this, we were as excited as any one of you, and we went to the product groups and you know, gung-ho about getting it deployed. They evaluated it. In fact, over the many years, program managers and you know, developers have built and rebuilt different versions of this technology again and again and again and again. 
And in fact, uh, 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 you know, Venkat, I don't know if you go through it or not, but he has published, even recently has published more papers on the subject which are quite good. But every time they did it, the thing was always cut. They was always never, they never got to the point where they actually shipped the product. So why is that? Part of it is that anything you build has to work all the time, every time, everywhere, okay? It can't just work most of the time, which is why my comments, as you heard, is I don't care about 70, 80, 90%. I really don't. I care about 99.99% or I care about you know, some really large number because I know the problem is the moment you ship a product, for example, somebody, if it doesn't work, you're going to get a phone call and that's money wasted. And so now if you get, if you're like a company like ours, which is selling billions of units all over the place and you get even a small fraction of the cold calls, we are dead. We can't accommodate, we can't put that kind of money into the system to sort of try to uh, answer those calls. So it has to just work all the time. The problem with radar and the problem with many other localization schemes, while they're intellectually stimulating and they're very exciting and very interesting, is that they don't work all the time. And then, so there are other problems. First of all, you have to spend money in the infrastructure piece for it to work. Who's going to spend the money, right? What is the value proposition of doing something? And the value proposition has to be large enough that somebody will be willing to spend that extra money to create that in infrastructure, right? And if you, and, and the beauty, I think, of radar was that we did recognize that right in the beginning. And if you read the paper, you will see we said, that we are just going to uh, use the existing infrastructure. So that barrier we crossed, that hey, you already have connectivity, but we're gonna create this new thing that will be actually help. And looking back, I think one of the big things we did beyond radar, that I have to be very candid and admit uh, clearly, was not the way I, at least I was thinking too much, is that we actually created this new theme of research that you see all over the place, which is wireless sensing. Because if you think about what radar was, it was just sensing the, the RF, and RF signals and doing something cool with it. And paper after paper that you see now in multiple conferences is all about sensing, not communications, which was the core of networking. It's about sensing. So you could arguably say that radar was the first version where sensing was applied for wireless signals to do something productive. So I think all that is good. But going back to the other thing, which is that if it doesn't work and if it's not sustained, then you have to hold yourself to a higher bar if you want to be success. I'm very happy with the enthusiasm that you guys have on, on doing localization. I'm thinking that that's great. I think obviously you know, you're thinking that it's very useful, but don't just write papers. That's not what it is. So, um, and I think I, I just want you to uh, sort of think that, uh, keep citing the paper, that's a good thing. I like that. <laughs> but. <laughs> But other than that, uh, 16 years after, 17 years after, the fact that we don't have, everyone doesn't have it today, must force us to do some soul searching and figuring out uh, what is it that we are not doing precisely. Um, and Venkat, you should come on over. And uh, the other thing I would say, I want to leave you with some uh, optimistic part of it. That I actually feel that the localization that gives you centimeter level localization is the more valuable localization than the one we did, which was about three meters or whatever. We argued for whatever, but that's my own personal opinion. I think if you can get the localization to be that that's, uh, good, then you have created something that is truly, truly useful. So, so yeah, and I'll, I'll just uh, leave it at that. I hope I didn't actually bring it down. I just wanted to be very honest with you about uh, what I learned here. But you will, you will make uh, everybody Don't happy. Don't leave the stage, stay here. <laughs> okay. You can go and have a seat. Uh, okay. Well, first of all, uh, can you hear me? It's fine. Yeah, uh, I, I would like to thank Sigmobile for the honor. It's uh, really, uh, you know, quite humbling to uh, see the community recognize uh, this work. So, you know, Satya and Victor gave really, gr really good sort of I would say technical overview and context for the respective papers. It's a tough act to follow. I'm not going to even try. So I'm going to actually talk about something completely non-technical, just the story behind the paper. Actually, it was kind of interesting to hear Ramit talk about how beautiful the paper is. Maybe you will change your mind after you hear this presentation. So uh, this is a presentation by me with Victor, who till a few minutes ago didn't know what the content was precisely. Now he knows a little bit. And uh, he doesn't quite know what embarrassment awaits him. <laughs> no, that's why I want to 
So, you know, Victor already gave the context. So, you know, he joined Microsoft in 1997 and he was the first wireless networking guy. I joined a year later, uh, fresh with a PhD uh, from Berkeley. And I'd also worked on some wireless and wavelength and so on there. So I kind of doubled the size of the networking group. So we went from one to two. And, uh, you know, the fall and winter of 1998, we teamed up and, you know, did pretty much all the technical work that went into the, uh, into the paper. So all that was good. And then, you know, there is this conference, little conference called SIGCOM. And we thought, okay, we will send the paper to SIGCOM. And uh, everything was very good. They had a paper submission deadline at end of January. And as was customary those days, they extended by a week. That was pretty much taken for granted. So that was very good. We had an extra week, a lot of time. Everything was good up to this point. Well, the hitch was that we decided to write this paper on, at around lunchtime on the day of the deadline. Until then, we had not written a single word. We had basically done experiments, collected data, and so on. We had not written anything. No worries. OK, we were young. I guess I was young. Victor was also young. <laughs> so uh, we worked. I mean, I've never done this, I think, uh, before or since. Worked for about, I think, 26 hours at a stretch and wrote the paper. Right? We started around lunchtime on 5th, and around 2 PM on 6th, the paper was uh, done. And then, I guess disaster struck. So we went there, SICOM, well, the FTP site was down. It was no longer up, and we were shocked. I mean, we never expected that program chairs would go in on a weekend and pull the plug on a submission site. We thought, okay, you know, we had the entire weekend. Uh, we kind of almost assumed. <laughs> well, yeah, we could have kept the paper to ourselves, but. So uh, no worries, I guess we wrote to the program chairs. We wrote a nice email, very polite email where uh, we told them these things and actually I would like to, we could of course tell them that we started writing the papers the previous day, we said there were procedural wrangles and <laughs> so we had to, uh, couldn't submit in time. Very polite, of course a polite response came back saying oh, we are sorry and all those things. And you know, just in our defense, this sentence here actually calls out, you know, several people, some very influential also asked for an extension. So it was kind of the norm, it was a you know, kinder and gentler world then you know, deadlines were not hard. You could sort of, you know, be nice to the program chair and maybe, maybe they'll give you a couple of extra days. So we were kind of counting on that. Uh, but I guess, unfortunately, it didn't work out. And clearly, our procedural wrangles thing did not, uh, you know, uh, find favor with the program chairs. And they said, we still don't know why you didn't submit in time. <laughs> so in all this exchange, you know, and then afterwards, the exchange got a little less polite. But still, I mean, <laughs> it didn't change the result. But at the end, uh, you know, when I look back at the communication, I still have those emails. I think the only one bit that we said, which in retrospect, I guess we were right about, was this. We actually told them, you know, we have some really interesting research results in this paper. Not that that is an excuse for submitting late, but uh, I guess that one little bit we were right about. So anyway, so basically now, what do we do? We had this paper written up. Yeah, so we had this paper written up, and uh, we didn't know what to do. Now, the research community, you know, including this community, is really, really good at solving problems. You know, when faced with a problem, they solve it, right? So, in fact, they've solved it, right? So, essentially, these days, there are lots of alternatives around the year. You have deadlines and conferences, very good conferences that you could submit to. The only slight hitch was, back in 1999, all these were in the future, right? These are yet to be created, yet to be sort of, uh, you know, even conjured up. So, uh, of course, these were not options. So then again, we are uh, back to the drawing board. So what do we do? Well, there was this little conference called Mobicom, which, you know, interestingly was happening in Seattle. And I think Victor was general chair, right across the lake from, you know, where I used to be, I guess Victor still is, very convenient. But for some reason, we decided not to go there and instead submitted to Infocom, which is where the paper eventually got sub uh, accepted. Now, you might think, oh, you know, we picked the location and it's interesting and all those things to have a good time. Well, not quite because, you know, the submission deadline for Mobicom we had missed by three weeks. This one we missed by 12 hours and that one was over, I guess those days Mobicom used to happen earlier or something. So anyway, so basically Infocom is what we went with. Any people from Israel here? Anyone? Zero? Okay. Anyway. So uh, it turned out to be a terrific conference, really good conference. The, I would say the best conference I've been to. You agree? Yeah. Well, the present one may be excluded. Well, maybe, well, I don't know. We'll see. 
and every single session we were pushing new frontiers. For example, we went to the Golan Heights. On the other side is the frontier with Syria, right? So I think the background is Syria. So I guess Victor and I generally had a good time. We looked at some captured tanks and, and so on. Uh, a different session, we went to uh, check out a few other things. I guess there were various other things going on, holding snakes. Have we never done it before or since? Uh, huh? That's you, Victor. No, it's that's, not. That's, that's, uh, okay, what of hands? Show of hands. That's Victor. A different Victor, younger Victor. So now you might think, you know, look at these guys, you know, uh, Victor and Venkat. They missed the deadline, they didn't submit the paper on time, and then they are off in this, you know, distant place having fun instead of, you know, attending a conference. Well, and you know, not quite. For example, this picture here clearly shows me reading, catching up on some reading, right? So I'm on the Dead Sea, I think reading some Infocom, Infocom papers. And you might think I'm off on my own. Well, not quite. Well, there is another person reading. And who, who do you think that is? Yeah, so he's there. He's not here at this conference, but this gentleman is very much at this conference. Professor Kangshin from Michigan. <laughs> So all of us were having a session in the Dead Sea. So this is all during the conference, I think. Uh, so it's all uh, good. So anyway, so, so that was the uh, end of the fun part. Then we actually made it to our session. We actually went and presented a, a paper. And these are some of the original slides. Uh, now, as is customary in the community, you have to you know, trash pre previous work. You have to sort of say why you're better. Unfortunately, we ended up trashing one of the fellow awardees of the Test of Time Award, which is the Active Badge paper where we said their system scales poorly and requires specialized infrastructure. Well, we had to say something, so sorry we said that. So we did all this. Hey, Roy, so I think <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, Roy is here. Oh, yes. I think your system was great. So, you know, normal conference, you go there, you expect feedback. Yeah, we had a lot of feedback. I don't remember one bit of it. The only feedback I remember is from a non-conference attendee. And that is actually uh, from the Israeli airport security, right? So when I was leaving the country, uh, I was told that, you know, they check people and so on. So the guy asked me why I'd come. Uh, he had asked, uh, did I come with anyone else? I said, yeah, there was Victor. And where is he? Well, I don't know. Maybe the guy thought we were like a you know, two-man team on a mission and he's still <laughs> scouting places. I don't know what, what they were thinking. But anyway, so for some reason, he didn't believe me when I said I was at a conference the previous days. I mean, based on these pictures, I guess, maybe he was right. but. He didn't, he didn't believe me. So he said, show me your slides. So he actually looked through my entire PowerPoint presentation. I had to turn on my laptop, run through the slides. And later on, I heard that I had it easy. Some other people actually had to give their talks. <laughs> at airport security, speak to your slides, at least speak through some of your slides. And uh, uh, maybe, I mean, that, I guess, free education, I guess, for the Israeli airport security. <laughs> so anyway, so we got a set of slides that were checked by security. So, you know, bulletproof, rock solid slides, which we reused. Uh, so anyway, my last slide, so what are my takeaways? If you're looking to write papers as an author, you know, don't be discouraged even if you stumble at the starting block as we did. I mean, we missed the deadline for the conference that we wanted to uh, go with. Uh, and if you're reading papers, uh, you know, don't be in awe of papers even if they won the uh, you know, test of time award or uh, been highly cited. Maybe they've written in 12 hours or 24 hours, right? <laughs> So, which was the case with our paper. So, uh, yeah, so that's all I have. Thank you.